As a scholar of leadership and a historian, here are a few things that I know for sure. Each of us as members in the Global Village knows what is right and what is wrong. Most of us share a small set of core values, the same values we want our kids to absorb and grow into and live by, the same values we want our leaders to represent and guide us toward, the same values we want to steer our common ship of humanity toward. We know those things deeply and in many cases unalterably. At the same time, however, there's an enormous amount of noise at this moment, here at the beginning of the 21st century, covering up those values, and in some cases, steering us in ways that lead us in different directions from those values. A lot of that noise is about the Global Village's recent and very powerful infatuation with money, with getting it and spending it and borrowing it and lending it and defining ourselves by it. Another big hunk of that noise is all about our sudden, very real, very, very common interest in instant fame. We see that in reality TV shows. We see that in so much of what's happening on the internet. We see it in ourselves and we recognize it as something very, very motivating, just like our relationship with money. Make no mistake about it, fame and money are important, but they're not the whole story. And for most of us, a deeper, truer, more satisfying and engaging story is one that's about walking a path very connected to our core values and to building something meaningful that lasts and that offers value to people other than just ourselves. So what are the things we need to be knowledgeable of and mindful of if we are to get beneath the noise and act in truer concert with our stronger, more authentic selves? The first thing we need to be knowledgeable of is that most of us are reacting most of the time. We're in a kind of reactive mode in which we're responding to our smartphones and technology and emails and all kinds of different fires that we're fighting in and outside of our workplace. Being reactive and being supple and being able to respond quickly is very, very important. But if that's the principal way in which we are living out each day, then we're missing more than we're achieving. We are missing all kinds of nuances with others. We are missing what's going on in the broader world. We may be missing or neglecting the calls and imperatives and duties of citizenship or the duties of being a good partner in a relationship or the responsibilities that go with being a good parent and a good neighbor. We are missing some of the art and magic that's in the natural world and that's all around us. The most important thing we may be missing by reacting all the time, by taking action before we take a deep breath and absorb and think and plan, is we may be neglecting our absolutely critical duty to listen and to learn from that listening. So the first thing we want to be very conscious of is that for most of us, reactive mode is the place where we spend the majority of our energies. The second thing we need to understand follows logically from the first. If we are always in reactive mode, if that's the place we're defaulting most of the time, then there's a lot of things we aren't doing. We aren't planning for the future. We aren't thinking in a broad, open-minded way about the different kinds of turbulence around us and what we need to do to navigate through that to some bigger end. We aren't spending a lot of time nurturing and developing and understanding the people around us that are looking to us for guidance. In the midst of great change, accelerating transformation, we can't be effective leaders if we don't do something more than simply react. The third thing that it's critical to understand is a personal consideration. And that is, 
for each of us, there is precious little time to reflect. Reflection is essential to doing any kind of lasting, satisfying, powerful work. Imagine Michelangelo trying to paint the Sistine Chapel ceiling without having time to step back and really look at what he was doing. To step back and look at other painters' works. Imagine Abraham Lincoln dealing with the thorny, critical, really messy issue of slavery during the Civil War and doing it completely in reactive mode. Imagine an entrepreneur like Estee Lauder trying to invent beauty products in the 1930s without stepping back and looking at women's lives, without thinking about what they needed and what they might use. All work that endures, that has important impact, that is ultimately worthy, is built as much on proactive thought and action, and particularly on reflection, as it is built on suppleness and reacting and solving problems. A fourth thing we want to consider is that being in reactive mode most of the time is actually limiting our field of vision. There are increasing studies about what we see and what we don't when we're spending so much time on our smartphones, when we're so busy moving from thing to thing, when we're multitasking with great vast amounts of time in the day. We're missing what are our roles as citizens and members of our respective communities. We're missing what we owe to the next generation. We're missing what we can each do to deal with the pressing challenges of environmental problems and global equity in a big interconnected world. A fifth thing that we need to remember is that if we are to address the pressing issues of the early 21st century, from our environmental problems, to the volatility of the global financial system, to the health issues affecting billions of people around the world, we have to look somewhere else than our blackberries. The solution to all of those problems is not more information. We have way too much information. The solution lies in the translation of information into knowledge, knowledge into understanding, and understanding into wisdom. And all of that critical translation will take place in the human head, and the human heart, and in the human spirit and in the collective energy that we marshal together to address those problems. David Foster Wallace, an American novelist, once wrote that effective leaders are people who help us overcome the limitations of our own fears and selfishness and weaknesses and get us to do harder, better, more important things than we can get ourselves to do on our own. If we're to lead each of us individually and together to that standard, then we simply have to turn the current relationship between most of us and our technology on its head. We have to have our Blackberries and our smartphones, our iPads and our iPhones become servants. And we individually have to become the masters using technology to help us achieve wisdom, to help us lead others and ourselves to higher, better, more important things than we could do all by ourselves. There's no other way forward. The stakes are high. We need to turn this around now and look up and out from our gadgets. The sixth and final thing that we want to be very aware of is that one of our greatest responsibilities today is actually to the next generation. We don't own this moment and this earth. We're passing through it. And we forget in the hustle and bustle of our days, in all the toing and froing that most of us do, that what we do each day has great ramifications, not only for our children, but for their children and for the children after them. I study leaders. I've been doing this for two decades. I follow them individual. I follow them in groups. I've had the great privilege of coaching a lot of people with very, very big jobs and huge amounts of responsibility. 
And it's so interesting to watch how the people all around them, those that they know directly, those that report to them, and many that are layers down or several layers out from a, from a particular leader, model the behavior of that person. So if each of us is spending an enormous amount of time reacting and looking at our smartphone and pulling it out in meetings or at restaurants or in the car, trust me, your children, your employees, your friends, your acquaintances, your colleagues are doing the same thing, partly because you're doing it. So somewhere in all this, a few of us, maybe more, have to decide that we're going to put a stake in the ground and look up and look out and try and treat technology and our responsibilities to be good citizens and good parents and fine, watchful, faithful stewards of our planet and all the creatures that inhabit it and do that to the best of our ability. And that will mean that millennials and our kids and people all around the world in industrialized countries that are just getting access to that technology will have standards and guardrails and a highway to travel on with that technology that's harnessed to something bigger than just the next app, just the next game, just the next text or email message. There's no time to waste. If we're to maximize the promise and minimize the peril of the early 21st century, we have to really take a stand with this. Margaret Mead, the American anthropologist, once wrote, never doubt the ability of a small group of concerned citizens to change the world. Indeed, nothing else ever has. Let us, as a small group of concerned citizens, put down our default drives, put down our phones even briefly, put down all that reactivity, and take the first step towards a more proactive, a more nurturing, a more building kind of stance. We can do it. We will do it. This, I know for sure.